Hello and welcome to the American Air Museum here at Duxford in the United Kingdom. This museum recognises and remembers the American aircraft that have flown from bases in the UK. And in this video I'm going to take you on a detailed tour around this whole museum. Now if there is a specific aircraft that you're interested in, then I'll leave those details in the video description below, or the chapters uh, or, or timestamps, which you can also skip ahead to. But otherwise, sit back and enjoy the tour. I'm Paul Stewart and I make videos about planes. This includes reviews on board flights around the world and detailed tours through interesting aircraft in museums. If you're into these types of videos, then please check out my channel and subscribe. Welcome to this second and long guided tour video from Duxford and in this one we're looking at just the American Air Museum, which you can see on this map of the whole facility. Now I don't know about you, but this is possibly one of the greatest entrances to any aviation museum in the world. The whole back wall is a giant window, so the lighting makes the filming somewhat difficult, but alas, let's get into it. We'll come back to this Bruins looking B-52 and turn right. This is a replica SPAD, which was a French built biplane used by the US Army Air Service during the First World War. So this was back before the formal Air Force had been created. It was powered by a V-8, of course, if the Americans were going to buy it, which produced around 200 horsepower. It carried two machine guns and up to four 25 pound Cooper bombs. This here is a Boeing Stearman, model PT-17 biplane used as the primary military trainer aircraft during World War II. Following that is a North American T-6 Texan advanced trainer aircraft, used from 1935 until the 1970s. After pilots had learned the basics of airplanes from the previous aircraft, they now stepped into the more powerful trainer which was much closer in feel to the real fighters they'd be flying shortly. And speaking of, here we are the iconic North American P-51K Mustang, which was a brilliant piece of Anglo-American design. They were a great design but the original Allison engines weren't powerful enough and it was actually engineers at Duxford in 1942 that suggested that they install more powerful Rolls-Royce Merlin V12s. With the changes, it went on to be a brilliant aircraft. Early models came with four machine guns, but later models were fitted with six of them. And you can see two underwing fuel tanks to extend the range, or it could also carry two bombs there instead. Let's check out this Boeing B-17G Flying Fortress and it's incredible to think that it almost didn't happen. In fact, the prototype crashed so Boeing lost the original contract, but quietly the Air Force was so impressed that they asked Boeing to keep working on it and in the end, they made over 12,000 of them. It was powered by four Wright R1820 Cyclone Turbo Supercharged radial engines producing 1200 horsepower each and mated to three blade Hamilton standard constant speed propellers. And I'm sure you've heard the story of the name where a journalist for the Seattle Times commented that the model 299 prototype looked like a 15 ton flying fortress. Boeing liked the name so much that it stuck. Now looking at the nose, it really highlights how heavily armored it was, although this chin turret was only added later after German pilots learned to attack directly from the front, as the underside ball turret couldn't fire forward because of the props and the antennas. It had a conventional landing gear with the two main wheels at the front, while the later B-29 moved to a more modern tricycle layout than most aircraft use these days. The wheels didn't fully retract up into the engine cowling, thus allowing for a smaller assembly and it could still land even if the gear got stuck retracted. I'll link to my guided video tour through a B-17 below. Next up is the consolidated B-24 Liberator. This was quite a different design to the B-17 with the tricycle undercarriage and used a single nose wheel and high position wing which allowed for the engines to be positioned higher and the props further away from the ground. Now while the crews possibly preferred the B-17, more of these were built, in fact over 18,000 of them were with 8,000 of those being assembled by the Ford Motor Company who paused car production to help with the war effort. This holds the record for the world's most produced bomber and American military aircraft. The B-24 was known to constantly leak a small amount of fuel, therefore they would fly with the Bombay doors slightly open to help dissipate the fumes. 
Now, while smoking was common during flights back of that era, it was strongly discouraged in the B-24. Sadly, the aircraft was nicknamed the Flying Coffin because of the difficult controls and quite poor low-speed performance. In fact, when the US government were looking at having the first dedicated presidential aircraft, this was considered as Churchill was using one, but the Secret Service expressed concerns about safety, so they went with a modified Douglas DC-4. And looking at the tail, you see that it has a double fin design similar to the Lancaster. This allowed for two smaller vertical control surfaces behind, rather than a single larger one like you see on the B-17 and 29 as well as putting the fin directly behind the propellers, thus increasing the rudder authority. Again, we spin back to the B-17 briefly and you can see the single tail fin is much taller, therefore it would need a much taller hanger. And looking up is the North American B-25 Mitchell. This medium bomber was powered by two 14-cylinder radial engines, featuring a twin-tail design similar to the Liberator. Most of the 9,000 built served during the war in the Pacific. In fact, it was this aircraft used for the Doolittle raids on the Japanese mainland just four months after the attack on Pearl Harbor. You may recall that 16 of these were launched from the aircraft carrier USS Hornet, where they would fly to Japan, attack industrial targets, and then continue on to land in China. While the damage was limited, the psychological effects would have been more significant of the Japanese who thought that they were well protected. Next is a giant leap forward in aircraft design. In fact, it was the most expensive single project of World War II, the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. Being pressurized, this introduced a whole new level of comfort for the crew, as well as an incredible computerized and remote control gunning system. While the B-17 gunner would sit literally inside the turret, this guy would be sitting comfortably inside and control the turret with a click of a switch. Other advances over the B-17, which I point out in my separate tour video, was the much smoother and more aerodynamic fuselage, which will also become evident at the front, where the much rounder shape was also much easier with the pressurization. While the B-17 had rivets and bits all along the skin, this was much smoother, and the small amounts of drag all added up when you're flying large distances. The landing gear introduced Boeing to the modern tricycle layout and it was powered by four 18-cylinder Wright R3350 turbo supercharged engines and interestingly, that nose wheel didn't steer so the pilots would turn by modulating the engines on either side. Overheating was a big problem with this engine and you'll see these cowling flaps that could be opened which exhausted hot air and enabled cool air to enter from the front. But they also increased drag so it was a fine line to take. Each engine had two turbochargers and one supercharger which maintained manifold pressure especially at high altitudes and provided vital extra power on takeoff. Yeah. And then we jump to the jet age with the Boeing B-52 Stratofortress, which is so massive it's pretty difficult to film. That's a large auxiliary fuel tank in front of you and underneath it is a wingtip outrigger wheel. Now fully laden with fuel and eight engines, these wings would droop so much that they'd need this wheel to keep the wingtips from hitting the ground. As well as burning fuel, they also injected water into the engines, which increased the mass being accelerated out of the engines, thus increasing thrust. And it also serves to cool the turbines. Now temperature is normally the limiting factor in turbine engine performance at low altitudes. So the cooling effect of the water lets the engine run at higher RPM with more fuel injected and thus more thrust created without overheating. The drawback of the system is that the injecting water does quench the flame in the combustion chambers somewhat, as there's no way to cool the engine parts without also cooling the flame. This leads to unburned fuel out in the exhaust and that characteristic trail of black smoke I'm sure you've seen on YouTube. The engines themselves are Pratt & Whitney J57 turbojets attached in pairs to the same pod, producing 10,500 pounds of thrust each. They are due to be replaced in coming years with these Rolls-Royce F-130 high bypass turbofans that currently power the Boeing 717s and other small private jets. It's interesting seeing how the aircraft skin has warped. To save weight, which maximizes the amount of fuel and weapons it can carry, they use the thinnest skin possible, and it's obviously not structurally important. You'll notice the bicycle landing gear fore and after the bomb bay, 
and these could rotate 20 degrees from the center line, allowing the aircraft to crab during crosswind landings or takeoffs. As this is the D model, it doesn't have the bulging that we see on later models, including this G model in Darwin, Australia. On the left, or the port side, is the EVS low light television scanner, and on the right side is the infrared scanner, and these allowed it to fly at low altitude during low light, but interestingly, they did adversely affect the aerodynamics and slow the top speed. And here we are back at Duxford. Next up is the McDonnell Douglas F4 Phantom II, which interestingly, the UK was the first export customer of. It's a two-seater, all-weather, long-range interceptor and fighter bomber, of which over 5,000 were built. Under this rather large nose is an advanced radar system, and of interest, there was no gun. Missiles were meant to be the future of warfare, but in Vietnam it became evident that dogfights still happened, so a pod with their M61 Gatling gun was quickly installed. As well as having a top speed of Mach 2.2, it could carry a lot of equipment with nine external hardpoints for missiles and other devices. A unique feature was the shape of the wing. Lateral instability was noticed during wind tunnel testing, so the wings had to be angled upwards, called a dihedral. But they didn't want to redesign the titanium central section of the aircraft, so they just angled up the outer part of the wings quite dramatically, which did the trick. And looking at the tail is the exhaust of the General Electric J79 turbojets, which unsurprisingly created so much heat that the tail end had to be covered with heat reflecting materials as to avoid catching fire. You'll notice that the tail plane has quite an extreme downward angle, or a anhedral, which kept it away from the exhaust gas and also improved control at high angles of attack, which is where the nose of the aircraft would be sticking up in the air. These were used extensively in the Navy, and if you look closely, you can make out the heavy duty arrestor hook for carrier landings. These were retired from active service with the US in 1996, but the Germans continued until 2013 in the Luftwaffe and 2021 with the Japanese Self Defense Force. Here's a quick glimpse back at the B 52's massive bomb bay, where it could carry up to 70,000 pounds of bombs, missiles, and many other things. It could also carry missiles and even the X 15 rocket plane, which I filmed here in Dayton, Ohio, in under wing pylons. And by the way, check out my long and detailed tour through the B 52 and the B 36, B 29, and 17 videos for that matter, as the bomb bays are surprisingly massive and quite tiny in the B 17, and I'll link to those videos below. And speaking about the US Navy, here's another aircraft that was originally designed for them, but the Navy cancelled the contract. The General Dynamics F-111 Aardvark. This was a twin-seat supersonic multi-role fighter that could attack, including with nuclear bombs, do reconnaissance, and electronic warfare. Inside that massive nose was a radar system allowing it to use an advanced terrain following system, whereby the crew could set the altitude above the ground and then the aircraft would pitch up and down following the ground even in the dark. The whole idea was that it would allow it to safely fly below enemy radars through valleys and around mountains. Another interesting design was to have the two pilots sitting next to each other rather than behind each other so that they could communicate easily. And instead of individual ejector seats where the crew would be hit by quite a blast of air at Mach 2.5, they used a crew module where the whole cockpit would be blown out from the rest of the aircraft and land on a large airbag, softening the impact and also acting as a flotation device on water. Underneath here was a storage area for a whole array of equipment, including the PaveTac targeting system, where the pod would move out from here and direct a laser at the target, and a camera could be used by the weapons officer inside to direct an explosive directly to it. Here's the targeting screen inside an F-111 from my video in Darwin. Here's the air intake for the two Pratt & Whitney TF-30 afterburning turbofans, each producing up to 25,000 pounds of thrust. Of particular interest, it had variable sweep wings, and the current sweep was for top speed. Now these pylons here would rotate as the wings sweep, so that they were always facing forwards, thus minimizing drag. As you can see, the wing almost completely lines up with the tail plane, almost forming a bit of a delta wing, which, as we know, is great at high speed, but not ideal at low speed. 
here's the exhaust for the turbo fans, and between those are the fuel dump valve, which makes for some incredible airshow footage. And these here would have been electronic countermeasure equipment installed that could confuse enemy missiles. While the Navy cancelled this, over 500 were made for the US Air Force and the Royal Australian Air Force who retired them in 2010. Now hanging from the roof up here is a 30mm GAU-8 Avenger rotary autocannon, which is attached to some wings. It's an A-10 Thunderbolt II, which remains in service with the USAF in a close air support role, and I'll come back to that soon. This here is a Lockheed U-2 high altitude reconnaissance jet introduced in 1956, and incredibly still flies to this day, albeit with a lot of upgrades. I guess there's the old saying that if it's done right the first time, then it doesn't need to be replaced. The thin, lightweight wings provided a lot of lift, which was really important at extremely high altitudes, and there was no wing sweep as speed wasn't really a priority. When designed, they believed that it could fly above Soviet radar, missiles and interceptors. At a cruising altitude of 70,000 feet, the sky is no longer a light blue colour, but rather dark blue or black, hence why it is painted that colour. When the Americans found out that they couldn't fly over Soviet defences, they decided to outrun them with the Lockheed SR-71 reconnaissance aircraft that you see here. Capable of speeds in excess of Mach 3, it had a whole range of fascinating design aspects which I'll mention in another detailed video. At the front here, you have a receiving antenna that detects hostile radars and missiles and then moving back is the transmitting antenna that will send a signal on the same frequency back to the radar or missiles and confusing them. Of interest, there was no defences on the rear part of the aircraft because it was just so fast that it could outrun the missile. Moving down, we have the forward landing gear. At Mach 3, the aircraft skin heats up to over 300 degrees Celsius, so the rubber tyres inside there would melt. To get around this, they had to pump cold air-conditioned air into the wheel well, which is then vented out through here. They used titanium because it was strong enough to handle the extreme temperatures, although it would still expand at high speed, so at ground temperature, the aircraft would have quite large panel gaps, like the one that you see here. In fact, the gaps are so large that the fuel would leak through them and drip onto the ground. Now, this wasn't as bad as it sounds because it used a unique fuel called JP7, which wasn't remotely flammable unless it had a unique chemical called TEB mixed immediately into it. Their stories of ground crews throwing lit cigarettes into barrels of the stuff to frighten apprentices on their first day. In fact, it was so inert that it was pumped around their whole aircraft as a heat sink, similar to radiator fluid, before eventually returning to the engines for ignition. Powering it were two Pratt & Whitney J58 turbojets producing 34,000 pounds of thrust each, propelling it to a top speed of around 2,200 miles per hour, although there's rumours that that's an underestimation. The service ceiling was an incredible 85,000 feet. You'll notice that the rear tires are silver, and that's because they had aluminium particles within the rubber to reflect the heat so that they wouldn't melt. These triangle shapes here are early stealth technology where sharp angles were believed to reduce radar return as we saw on the F-117, and these panels were also made of radar absorbing material. And moving back around we see the two engines here have been removed from the aircraft. They're incredible things but what's really interesting is these bypass lines here on the sides. Normally a jet engine compresses the air in the first part. But a Mach 3, the speed itself simply compresses the air, therefore the incoming air can bypass that part of the engine and is dumped directly into the rearward section for ignition. It's similar in principle to a ramjet, which is a lot more efficient. And looking inside the rear, you have these circles, which is where the fuel is dumped uniformly into the exhaust for ignition as the afterburner. You can see small holes within the metal as atmospheric air will be blown through these to avoid it all melting from the extreme heat. I've got a much more detailed video where I crawl around and underneath an SR-71 in Dayton, Ohio, and I'll link to that video below. You may have heard the story, but there wasn't a lot of titanium in the USA back when this was being developed in the 1960s. In fact, most of it was actually in the USSR. So, the CIA set up fake companies in other countries who then purchased the titanium and then secretly shipped it to the United States. 
There's also stories of an extreme level of security around the aircraft. They only allowed married men to work on the project because they were less likely to divulge secrets to seductive Soviet spies. Jumping many decades into the future, and we have the MQ-1 Predator used by the USAF and the CIA from 1995 until 2018. These drones were initially used for reconnaissance and intelligence before later being enabled for targeting purposes where they could directly communicate with F-16s. Then in 2001, they will weaponize themselves with two Hellfire missiles. These have now been replaced with the MQ-9 Reapers. Now this scene here is incredible for a Cold War av geek. You've got a B-52, the SR-71, the U-2, and then there's this missile, a Soviet S-75 service-to-air missile. In fact, it was one just like this that in May 1960 shot down Francis Gary Powers on board a Lockheed U-2 over flying the USSR. This was a huge shock for the Americans as they previously believed that they were safe at 70,000 feet. Hence the move to then outrun defenses with the SR-71 rather than try and fly over them. Now continuing on with the A-10 that I mentioned earlier. Because this is designed to fly low, it'll be more vulnerable to small arms fire, hence the unique design. It has a twin tail so that there is a redundancy of controls if one is damaged. It has high mounted engines to, again, protect them as much as possible from bullets hitting the underside. And there's clever use of titanium armor plating, which also includes a tub that the pilot sits in to keep them as safe as possible. Armor isn't really a consideration in almost all modern military aircraft, except it is in this one because it's flying so low. I mentioned the huge gun earlier. In fact, here's a photo of the shells next to my hand for comparison's sake at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Arizona. As you can see on the wings, the A-10 has many hard points where a whole array of bombs and missiles could be attached. And speaking about the engines earlier, they use a General Electric TF-34 turbofans, which run cooler than turbojets, thus reducing the heat signature for heat-seeking enemy missiles. And here's the cannon I mentioned, and here's a photo of one on display in Dayton, Ohio, with an A-10 behind it. It really highlights how big it is, and it's incredible to think that it fires at just under 4,000 rounds per minute. In the center here, and while it makes for an incredible view, it is difficult to film for this video, is a McDonnell Douglas F-15A Eagle. This was a successor to the F-4 Phantom II that you saw earlier, and was designed to dominate the sky and fight against Soviet fighters. It remains in service with many countries around the world, and since the introduction in 1976, none have ever been lost in aerial combat. I'll mention a few random things that I didn't film during the first sweep around. This is under the B-52, and these antennas are all a part of the electronic counter-measuring equipment. Unlike earlier bombers, these don't have any guns other than the rear turret, which was eventually removed, so their main defense is this equipment. Much of it remains classified, but essentially it detects enemy radar and missile signals, and then returns fire with signals on the same frequency, designed to either deflect the weapon elsewhere, or with enough energy to fry the receiving system. They can also confuse the radar system by sending back returns that show that the aircraft is in a completely different location. This metal cylinder is really interesting. This is part of a 156 meter long barrel for a planned Iraqi supergun. The ball was one meter, and to give you an idea of the size, here's a photo of me posing in front of it. Saddam Hussein commissioned this program, and this would have been suspended by cables and could shoot projectiles into orbit. There was quite the scandal when it was discovered that components were being made by Western countries, and the Canadian artillery expert, Gerard Bull, was suspiciously assassinated in 1990. This display outside the museum is really sobering. For every aircraft stenciled on this glass, there was one lost during World War II flying out of a British base. It's hard to fathom as obviously many of these were larger aircraft with multi-person crews, so the human loss is horrific and pretty unsettling when you think about it. Now I love the Avgeek grit and the engineering of these aircraft on display here, but it's always important to recognize the human cost of these horrible conflicts that we're only making passing mention of. This video is only the second part of my larger guided tour around the Duxford Air Museum, so please check out my other 40 minute video for much more similar footage. I've also visited museums in Seattle, Tucson, Dayton and many others, so there's hours of footage on my channel, so please check them out. Thank you very much for watching.